Well, like a lot of our films, this took years and years and years to make. Uh, this actually started in, uh, when did we start working on this? Back in 90, 97. 97. Jeez. Started writing down notes and adding more and more ideas to it. And then in, I'd say, 99, when we were all finishing up Toy Story 2, uh, I wrote the first draft of the script. And in less than a year, we got it up on story reels real quickly, and we've been pounding away seriously ever since. Why clownfish? Why did I pick clownfish? I don't know. They have great personality. They're funny. Clownfish, uh, I think you probably picked them because they have this great relationship with the anemone where... They don't really come out of the anemone very much. They stay safe within it, and yet are very colorful. And so I'm just speaking for you now. <laughs> that uh, maybe that was wise, because someone who is trapped sort of in their own world has to leave and go on a big journey. You are correct, sir. Oh, ding, 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 ding. Uh, yeah, actually, I knew nothing about clownfish. Yeah, I knew nothing about fish in general. <laughs> and and uh, But I knew the ocean would be cool, and I really wanted to see that world, and uh, I wanted to do a father-son story. And so I had to start looking at books. I had to pick a fish, and I opened up this one book at one point, and there was these two little orange fish with white stripes peeking out of what is now, I understand, an anemone. And, uh, an anemone. That's, a, that's an anemone, not an anemone. <laughs> Thanks, Leon Critch, code record. And then we had to technically figure out how to simulate an anemone. And uh, here are some of the tests that we had to do. They were just the most appealing fish, and I, and I wanted to know what was going on. And once I found out all the things that Mr. Peterson has explained to us, I said, oh, this is perfect. It's perfect for this sort of homebody father who's overprotective and looking out to make sure his son's not hurt at all. And, and uh, the fact that they stay close to that one spot, that is their home for their life. Uh, it uh, really kind of helped contrast the journey he has to take through this movie. So the ocean was really the metaphor for me for the story. It, it was perfect because I remember as a kid going under the water, just staring out at what I would call the void. I mean, just the water would just drop off and murk out, and anything could be out there. And I just thought, wow, the, the duality of that line. Um, you know, Anything could be out there. It can be a negative thing or it can be a positive thing. And that was exactly what I needed for this movie. I mean, this movie is about the battle of hope versus fear. It's, it's optimism versus pessimism. It's, it's half full versus half empty. And, and that's, that's exactly the issue for, for Marlon, for his, his, the main character. I mean, you can either hide from life or you can just enter it and take your chances and engage. Definitely tricky, the, you know, the, the tragic nature of the opening of the film, you know, just making it powerful yet uh not not overly uh brutal you know it was a it was a tough thing to to get to you know it's a very uh very trying experience for father right out of the gate in this movie yeah you needed you needed to you needed to bond these guys in a manner that that kind of amplified the commitment that i hope every parent feels when their child's born is, is that you know i will i will do everything. I will die for this little guy. Um, I will do whatever it takes to make sure he's okay. And, you know, we went to an extreme for that commitment, but I think you needed it for this kind of a movie. Um, and also just the vulnerability aspect, uh, amplifying how vulnerable and innocent and unprotected you feel your children are when they're first born. And I couldn't think of anything more moving than just finding this one leg exposed on the sand. You know, we actually had flashbacks or years earlier. We had flashbacks, and we were going to dole out this whole backstory. We we're just going to tell a little bit at a time. They, just, just start with them waking up now. Like you had, you now. actually had that structure for a very long time. Right? Yeah. Where, where uh, you never really quite knew, you know, how Nemo's spin was damaged, why Father was so overprotective. Uh, right. And, and you just kind of got little cryptic images throughout the film, kind of evocative iconic images that all kind of came together at the very end. On one level, that was fascinating, because you did ask questions like, why, and I want to know more, and you'd get these little windows of the past and of mom, and, and it was all leading up to this tragic event with the Barracuda. And ultimately, what made it fall apart was there was nothing big to reveal at the end. There was no aha uh -huh or surprise slant to it uh, that, that made you see it a way that you didn't suspect it was going. By the time you were getting to the end of the movie, you kind of suspected what the, the tragedy was, and sure enough, it was exactly what you thought it was. And so, 
The only other option was to either gratuitously put in an aha surprise, you thought it was red, but now it's blue, or to just remove the flashbacks and tell it right up front, which almost every film 101 book tells you to do, and I was... I was ignoring that. A lot of plates to keep spinning. You had three storylines that you were servicing, the flashbacks, Father's Journey, and also Nemo's you know, in-the-tank experience. So it's a lot to keep track of. Well, the other thing, one of the trickiest things in this film is that because we're telling two kind of completely separate storylines, we've got the story of Father searching for Nemo, and we've got the story of Nemo and what's going on in the tank, it was very difficult to find a, a nice balance between the two of those so that we could kind of maintain interest and energy in both storylines, but be able to, you know, jump back and forth between the two. And that was hard enough on its own, but then to introduce this whole idea of, of these flashbacks, that was just, you know, it was just a whole other element that was kind of trying to derail the train of the movie. And by taking those out, you know, the problems that we had became more manageable. Yeah, I mean, even on basic terms, you're telling, you're now telling two stories instead of three, and telling one is hard enough. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Remember after we um, after we got rid of the whole flashback structure, one of the first things that we tried doing was kind of more more of a comedic way of getting the backstory across about the tragedy, and that was to have Marlin tell Nemo a bedtime story. A lot of people ask why why did he have a bad little fin, and it used to be a stronger story point, and I had the option of taking it out because there was he was going to learn to swim better through the movie, and we ended up not having to do that. But I, I ended up thinking it was somewhat symbolic of whatever that little thing is that we all have in our kids that we worry is not up to snuff to manage in the world, whether it's their their education, their physical ability, their talents, their speech, whatever. There's always something that's like a mirror to you, like am I a bad parent? Are, are my kids not going to be able to handle life without me? And I just thought it was such a great physical, obvious little trait of that paranoia that a parent has that I kept it in. <laughs> I could go on and on and on about the lighting for this movie. It is just stunning and beyond words. Well, we can't get too far into this movie and not talk about Albert Brooks. Uh, he just absolutely saved this picture. He uh, is exactly what I needed this father character to be. You needed somebody that was neurotic, uh, overprotective, but still appealing throughout. And that is one of Albert's gifts, is that he can sort of play both. Usually it's a very off-putting thing, but he just makes it so winning. Um, and it's just, it's just an absolute honor to have worked with him. Uh, the bad joke telling. That was actually something that um, we came up with on the fly during a rewrite, but that was something that Albert Brooks just ran with. He ran, definitely ran with the deconstruction idea of the joke, that this is a clownfish that everyone assumes is hilarious. Clown, he's a clown, clownfish, and yet this guy cannot tell a joke to save his life. He was really good <laughs> at how to tell a joke wrong. Yeah. Albert was like the authority on that. Yeah, you can tell he's a jokeologist because he knows how to do it. It's so. amazing. We, we've got got literally like an hour of Albert telling this joke really, really badly. And the voice of Nemo, we should mention, is Alexander Gould, one of the toughest things to find as a child actor who doesn't sound like one. And uh, Alexander was just the real deal. He just sounded genuine, and he gave Nemo the sweet innocence, and we were just lucky to find him. Uh, Sheldon the Seahorse is played by Eric Persullivan, who is the uh, child star in uh, Cider House Rules, and people know him best in Malcolm in the yeah, I played that uh, to my brother. And then there's Pearl, who's the octopus. Uh, she's played by Erica Beck. And she played the um, the old woman in Titanic. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's an up-and-coming child actress. Uh, very talented. And then there's Tad, who's the yellowfish. He's played by Jordy Ramft, who is actually the son of Joe Ramft, who works at Pixar here. Everybody knows him uh, as the voice of Wheezy the Squeeze Toy Penguin and uh, Heimlich the Caterpillar. Jock in this film. That's right. Wait. So here's the big star of the movie. Bob Peterson is Mr. Ray. We actually have Mr. Ray right here in the studio with us right now. Oh, Andrew is such a good director. <laughs> and now I'm going to rhyme with the word director. But later, well, I'll write it down. Then I'll come and I'll be your clown. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you may want to do that one over. <laughs> That one's going to make the desk. <laughs> that was Lee Unkrich singing. <laughs> one of the animators, Brett Parker, was giving...
given the um, an enviable task of, of having to animate all of those kids sitting on uh, Mr. Ray's back. And she did an amazing job. I mean, they're just incredibly cute in every single shot. And she, uh, she did a great job. Yeah, she kind of ran with this little green crab peeking whenever he came. Hey, Mr. Ray, going back to Mr. Ray, Andrew, that was, we did a rewrite. That was your idea just to give everything around Nemo this life, you know, to the, the, have this wacky science teacher. I think John Lasker also weighed in with that. Just a science teacher that was really crazy. Just someone who would show Nemo the wonders of the place in a funny way. Yeah, there was always that one teacher that just seemed to love their subject matter to the point of ad nauseum. Yeah. And that you, you thought they were so geeky for liking it that yeah. much. Yeah. It was sort of the Tom Lehrer of... Right. Uh, of, of, of mana rays. Yes, singing the periodic tables. <laughs> and then we just tried to make the reef, in this short little moment, the most beautiful. We just wanted it to be paradise. We wanted it to be all the potential of what life can be on an optimistic way for Nemo. And this is the way that Father has denied himself for who knows how long of seeing what the world can be like. We used to have a whole protracted sequence right before this landing here where Father was kind of zipping around through the reef, trying to catch up with Nemo and, and being absolutely, completely scared of every little thing. It, it all stemmed from wanting to contrast how just open and adventurous Nemo and, and the class was compared to Father, who would stop at every red light or, or every sort of fish crossing. But, you know, we decided we didn't need to illustrate how overprotective Marlon was at that point. Yeah, you, you, just, you just totally got it from just seeing how his, his character was acting up to this point in the film. Well, one of the oldest images I always had for this film was just these kids arriving at the very edge of the coral reef where it just stops and it goes into just big open water. Sort of evoked what well, for me as a little kid was it was like to go underwater with goggles and be in a pool and see where the deep end just starts to slope off and it used to just spook the heck out of me. So I really wanted to try to evoke that. There's also something so cool about the sudden intrusion of the real world, of humans, into this idyllic space. It's just completely unexpected, and it's really shocking on a lot of levels. Mom, look at me! I tell you, it helps to have kids when you're doing a movie like this. You know, there's so much to draw from, just from dialogue and behavior and, and just your own feelings, like when you're talking about walking to work or walking on the street with Ben and how that how you felt and and we definitely there's an endless well to draw from and it's interesting that when we all started at pixar none of us had kids and it's like we all have big families now and it wasn't until i had kids that i really was amazed by the, the sort of the dual feeling of being my father's son and my son's father and just really being very well being able to straddle both those points of view and that really helped sort of form this movie and you're not coming back until you are. You think you could do these things, but you just can't, Nemo! Andrew, didn't, by having Nemo say I hate you to his father at that moment is, is that it... It's the last thing that his dad hears. It is the last hears. thing that dad hears, and it really helps drive Marlon to, to, to rescue Nemo and to get him back and try to, you know, fix things and repair the relationship. Right, there's that unresolved issue between them that's just going to hang there until the end of the movie. Mm -hmm. class, and he can get lost, you know, from sight of... Oh my gosh! Nemo's swimming out the sea! One of the other dangers of me having I hate you uh, in that moment earlier was... Um, that it could so easily become an ABC after school special, was a, which is a, it's a big fear. I didn't, I would always be trained to Bob's like, this isn't turning into an ABC after school special, is it? But you'd, you'd be the expert on ABC after school specials, wouldn't you, since you were in an ABC after school special? You don't need to go there. What was it called? I, I don't know. I don't remember. Uh, right. I don't remember. It wouldn't be I'm Dear not, Diary. Oh, that was it. That was it. <laughs> Look for you. Dear Diary at your local video <laughs> store today. This is never making it on the desk. <laughs> Big trouble, young man. Do you hear me? Uh, it's pretty scary. Yeah, the, I always thought. Awesome. I mean, it's just it, not not that I've experienced. I had never scuba dived when I came up with this scene. I just thought, from a fish's scale, this must be the most intimidating Godzilla moment ever. So it's right. the opposite of Jaws. Yeah, what you've said. It, yeah, exactly. That's how I used to always pitch it. It's like it's man after fish, and then we go, "Come on, Nemo, Jet, keep swimming. Don't look back." Um, you know, it's an intense moment. We had to walk a fine tightrope about basically this little kid being taken out of the ocean, and 
that's a traumatic thing. I think it's intense for little kids to experience, although it's it's sort of a fear that they they're going to gravitate towards in in children's stories because it's something that they do think about. It's the fear of being separated from yeah, the parents, right? Yeah. And it's a fear from the parental side, and so you know, it's uncomfortable on both both edges. But I needed something that would just resonate for the entire picture, so that the payoff at the end would be so satisfying that I would. It was willing to risk doing this kind of an event. It just kind of is the the catalyst for the entire rest of the movie. It helps me to find out that this monster that kidnapped him is this goofy dentist later too. <laughs> right, and that he and, and that he thought he was doing something good. I mean, yeah. again, it, it services the damaged fin aspect. He sees this little fish swimming all bizarrely and thinks he's he's going to save this thing from never surviving out in the wild. So this moment here, with Nemo kidnapped and father lost and distraught, um, this moment's always worked, and, I, and, and it's always worked for me, even from the earliest pitches. As a matter of fact, there was a point when I didn't have anything to show for the movie, and all I could do was pitch it to, and I, I had to present it to like 900 licensees, marketers at, uh, at the El Capitan Theater, and I could tell then I, I, I had them just from this moment. Dory. Dory. I'm sure I will say this on several other documentaries on this disc, but uh, Ellen DeGeneres was always who I had in mind when I was writing the script for this. Um, early, early on in very rough uh, forms, I thought that uh, it was a guy just because I'm a stupid male, and then I was in the middle of writing something in my um, bedroom, and my wife had the TV on, and she was playing the Ellen DeGeneres show, the shows how many years back this was, and, and I heard her change subject five times before one sentence had finished, <laughs> and, and it was so funny, Yeah. and I said, oh my gosh, that's it, that's how you should play short-term memory, and then and I couldn't stop thinking of her doing it ever since then, and I remember, I remember calling her after she had written, you know, had sent her the script, and I, I said to her, basically, I said, look, I am just so up the, <laughs> if you don't do this, and she said, okay, I better do it then. It was, that, it was that simple. It was really nice. It just turns out she is Dory. She is just as sweet, just as kind, um, and just as forgetful. <laughs> and she'll tell you that herself. She's a defender of Dory's character, too. I remember a few times we, we gave Dory a few lines that didn't sit well with her. It didn't have that innocence, you know, and so we worked with her and rewrote on the fly to get, to get some of those tuned up. This was a big challenge um, coming to this idea for this movie for me to structurally separate father and son and I really didn't want them to be connected back until the very end of the picture um, I just thought if I can make that work it will just feel so strong for having seen their changes and then get them back at the end but the tough thing is well if the issue is between the two of them how do you make them change um, with them separated and so some of the major key ingredients were coming up with a surrogate child for father and a surrogate parent for Nemo. And, uh, and Dory just having short-term memory and being this kind soul just allowed her to play the innocence and semi-ignorance of a child that, um, that father needed to test all the parental aspects that were his, his problem. And she was flawed enough that he had to, in a way, take care of her as they went, which was more you know, very paternal. And also, just for me, you know, father's issue is that he's so haunted by the past tragedy and so fearful of the future that those two rob him of being the very thing he needs to be at the end of this movie, which is to be in the moment with his son, to be just focused in that moment and enjoy it for what it is. And that's exactly the one gift that Dory has that she can give him, and she doesn't have the other two. So it was really well matched. Great white shark, cool. Yeah, that was the you know it's it's easy to say that these were probably the coolest characters to to uh, to create, to model, to design, to come up with, to voice, to animate. Uh, it was just a, you know all the guys are in boy heaven with all these with these three sharks, sharks and subs and things that blow up. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. Uh, Jim Capobianco, one of our story guys, um, actually was the guy that really came up with placing this all in a sub. The original idea for the sharks was actually that they had their meetings sort of in the area of the wrecks where the minefields were, and they actually, for recreation after the meeting, would play volleyball with active sea mines. I just figured they were just built-in thrill-seekers because of the species that they were. And uh, they just didn't mind the adrenaline rush of the explosion. But it kind of 
kind of was a prolonged sequence. It didn't have as much momentum as I hoped it would. And uh, Jim said, why, why don't you have a chase inside the sub? And we all went, went like, Ooh, said, wouldn't that be cool? Yeah. And I said, oh, there's no way we can do it. We don't have a budget to model me up. We're like, well, wouldn't it be cool? <laughs> and so so it, we just placed everything in there, got rid of the, the volleyball game. And uh, I'm so thankful that he pushed me on that. It's a stink of golfers. Golf? Yeah, I think they're so cute. Oh, look at me. I'm a flipping little dolphin. Let me flip for you. I know something. All right, then. Today's meeting is Bruce. Leader of the Sharks. Uh, he's voiced by Barry Humphreys. He's probably most famous for his uh, female character, Dame Edna. Hello! Hello! A lot of people don't know, but uh, he's like the Robin Williams of Australia. Uh, he can do all sorts of characters, has been doing them for decades. And uh, he could just do this great, uh, really heavy Outback Aussie for Bruce, and it was great. If you listen to, to that deep voice, you would never in a million years guess Dame Edna. I know. Was back in there. <laughs> I also had a rule for Australian, which was I didn't want everybody to be Australian, even though it was on the Great Barrier Reef. I thought once you got out to the reef, it could be international, and once the fish were in the tank, who knows where they were bought from, and it allowed us not to be stuck with having an entire Australian cast. It's very difficult to do when you're in the United States and you're not in Australia. But I did feel like it would just be so much funnier if, if the sharks felt like local boys, like just sort of out, sort of guys that have been out in the outback and sort of separate from society a little bit and just sort of just simple. The other cool thing about the Australian actors is that it was so cool to be able to to hire all these people that we've loved over the years. These different Australian character actors. Um, the guy who plays um, Chum in this is uh, Bruce Spence. He's the Mako shark with the uh, fishing hook nose ring. For anyone who's seen the, the Road Warrior, he was the uh, the gyro pilot. Yep. Snakes, I hate snakes. <laughs> Long giraffe. And I've always been a huge fan of Bill Hunter, who plays the dentist. He, he's just been in a, practically every Australian film ever been made. And Eric Bana is the hammerhead shark, and uh, everybody now knows him as the Hulk. And uh, he was great in Chopper. And he's just a, an intense and really, actually very gifted comedian and uh, as well. And, uh, we were lucky to get him before the Hulk came out. Yeah, he was beat. <laughs> he gave us so much energy, and man, that guy came out for such a long stint. You know, to have true Aussies playing the voices, it's just it just gives it that authenticity it needs. And I even promised Barry Humphreys that you know he asked me there, there's not going to be any fake Australian in this movie. And I was like, no, 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 I promise you. That's... And sure enough, everybody in it is the real deal that speaks Australian. So one embarrassing thing about doing scratch voices is that we try to do Australian and then have to show it to these wonderful actors, and it's just like, please ignore that. You know? <laughs> One thing, it was tough. Um, at one point, Dory actually got cut by a tooth. It was bleeding, and, and uh, I put my thinking cap on. What's the funniest way that you can actually let go bodily fluids like blood without, you know, yeah. being too gross? And getting clapped in the nose is yeah. the one that seems to be. That helps help make it a little innocuous. Because yeah, I think that's the first time we've put blood ever in a CG movie. Right. Let go of bodily fluids? <laughs> I'm a writer, I think in those kind of terms. We find a way out! Sorry, not <laughs> Bob's sincerely laughing at this movie. <laughs> That's not fake. Our little Ode to the Shining coming up. <laughs> you can read. The climax of this chase was pretty difficult. Oh, the explosions, yeah, when all the yeah, mines started exploding. It was hard because was the, uh, there was a... Bob, what are you doing? Photographer Chip. Can you do that a little bit quieter? Can you, does, does the mic pick this up? Okay. Yeah, just try to quiet. Right. It was hard because we, we set the bar so high, we created such a realistic world that we couldn't really be that stylized with the explosions. They had to be like real underwater explosions. So yeah. and we looked at a lot of reference footage and it was a very particular, difficult kind of effect to create. And the thing that's surprising is that it's only about one. Like, a half dozen shots. Yeah, and it just goes by and, and yeah, and there's like it's probably like weeks to months behind each of those shots just to get them right. And you know? it goes by in just a few seconds. And I mean, to do explosions underwater is very, 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 very difficult. Just ignore. And we tried and tried and tried to 
stay as highbrow as we could through this movie, but uh, <laughs> this one gag was just unavoidable, and I figured, well, if you're going to have a fart joke, this is the way to have one. Right. The tank actually came from... Um, I never thought of anything else but a tank in a dentist's office. Basically, I was I was raised going to my local dentist, Dr. Sam Ina, and uh, in uh, Ipswich, and uh, he had a tank in the wall uh, in the lobby where you waited for all the kids' books were and and your highlights magazines, and, and, it, was, and it had a little chest, a treasure chest, and a, a scuba diver. Although I think it was stationary, and I just remember spending. I actually looked forward to going to the dentist's office just so I could look in that tank. And when I used to recall it later on in life, I used to think, God, what an odd place that would be for fish to first see humans. And I remember as a kid thinking, gosh, I just assumed that the fish weren't from, they were from the ocean and they wanted to go home. So I just kind of assumed then from there that every kid must think that when they look at fish in a tank. And uh, so I thought maybe I'll be tapping into sort of a universal instinct if I, if I let that be a, a major aspect of the story. And, uh, and then as I got into it, it just seemed like a, a great place for potential gags and entertainment and just odd juxtapositions of things that could just keep it fresh and keep it interesting. I think if you had put this in a kid's room or an apartment or I don't know, it just it would have fallen a little flat or a little obvious. Plus, it lets you do a lot of uh, patient dentist gags, you know, in the background, getting drilled and things, you know, pain gags and things like that. So when we had to sort of figure out who these characters were in this tank, we gravitated the most to the idea of, of the loony bin, of, of, of being stuck in these four, this four-walled world, these four glass walls, and just the confinement of that, and what it would do to you to have to sort of resign yourself to the fact that I'm going to be here forever. And we looked at a lot of movies. Uh, Cuckoo's Nest. Cuckoo's Nest. Whoever's the Cuckoo's Nest. King, King of Hearts. Hearts. Yeah. And things like that to just sort of give us ideas for how you would, you know, react and how, and also just the ensemble sense that you get for uh, this sort of tiny community that's created. Like, what's the right mix of characters? Oh. <laughs> that, that, I, I take credit for that. Yes. <laughs> if you're going to have a scene in a dentist's office, you've got to have patients writhing in... in excruciating agony and I apologize to all the dentists out there including my cousin who is a dentist but I just had this vision of, of this shot where this patient would be in the foreground out of focus having some un unmentionable thing done to him with the fish watching in the background and I'm so glad I made it into the film. Well, they tell you when you write it's all about research research research. Bob did his research he, he, would, he was actually on the phone constantly with his hygienist trying to get the steps of the root canal right right, right we got it Officer Ronnie Douglas, DDS, and uh, we got really good technical dental speak that we worked in here. Oh, the pain we went through, we'd find out that the model for the head profile was too big, that the handle wasn't right. I mean, I said, I, and I was just bound and determined that four out of five dentists would laugh at this sequence. <laughs> yeah. You know, if no one else did, yeah. the dentists of the world will laugh. So, so I, it's like, I'm going to get this right. Now, the invention of Darla was a fairly late uh, thing in the process, too. Uh, the addition of a kind of a ticking clock of this little girl who's going to take Nemo away. And so, what do you do? Do you get him out? Uh, does he try to escape? And, and uh, so. And you used to have that ticking clock be kind of, there was a calendar hanging by the tank that, that showed when Darla was going to be showing up. Yeah. And we finally thought, you know, what, what better way to remind the audience that this evil little girl was coming by the but to get a photo of her sitting right there yeah. next to the tank, looming over every single scene in the film. With broken glass. But, uh, you know, Darla was so fun because, you know, actually we named Darla after Darla K. Anderson, who is the producer of Monsters and Bugs Life. As an homage, <laughs> not as a commentary on, you know, that she's a brat or anything like oh, that. Oh, really? Oh, oh, is that the party line? <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. That's... <laughs> That's why we did it, Andrew. <laughs> Shh, go along with it. Willem Dafoe was just so great as Gelp. He, he uh, has such an amazing timbre in his voice. I remember I had, I had sort of pared it down to about three different voices that I was considering, and I played it for John Lasseter, and he just stopped it right on Dafoe and just you know, stuck his finger on the monitor and said, that's the guy. Oh my gosh, what a great voice. Right, and 
going back to Platoon, for example, he strikes you as someone who was mysterious in that film, but also warm uh, when he took Charlie Sheen, Sheen when he took Charlie when he took Charlie Tuna under his wing. <laughs> <laughs> I meant to say yeah, Charlie Sheen. That's the thing that's amazing. He's a, he's got an he can be an intimidating presence very easily, but he's the kindest man, and he can also evoke that. And, you, and you're kind of thrown by it because you're not expecting it because he's got such a distinct face. Meanwhile, back at the submarine. Bob came up with another great line for Dory's kind of uh, sleep mumblies. It didn't make it into the film, but I, I truly think it's the most bizarre thing that's ever been written down on a piece of paper. And the line was... Oh, and then we should probably talk about the uh, sea monkey has my money. Depending on your age, you know, you know we're all in our 30s and our 40s, and we, uh, you know, you remember all those Kurt Russell movies, Walt Disney movies, with the computer that wore tennis shoes and the world's greatest athlete, and they all had Joe Flynn in them as the villain or something. In the, and so we just, somebody was playing Perez Prado music once, and it just sounded like the scores to that kind of a movie. He said, all those movies always had something like, hey, the monkey's got my money. Hey, hey, the monkey's got my money. Hey, give me the diamond. I'll give you the banana. Nice monkey. <laughs> Yeah, you know, listen, you know, my daughter's having a wedding by the pool. I don't want anything to go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Such a brutal setup. You know? <laughs> so, so I don't know. <laughs> As a joke to me, when we were coming up with these punchlines for what Dory could say in her sleep, Bob wrote, the sea monkey has my money. He said, well, I'll laugh. I don't know if anybody else will. <laughs> but we put it in, and, and everybody thought that was funny. The mask, where's the mask? Uh, Albert Brooks. When I first pitched this uh, to... To John and stuff, I would always say, like, I'm not an Albert Brooks type father. He's also one of our heroes, you know, just grow up with his great comedy that he's done. And uh, it's daunting to go into a booth with, with your hero, you know. Here we, here we are, these, you know, little animator kids going in there. And here's Albert Brooks. Wow. He was such a nice guy. I mean, the thing that amazed me about him was, you know, I, I kind of worried because, you know, he directs and writes back to almost all the stuff he does. And, Acts in it, and I thought, oh, geez, how much is he going to be critical of what what we're doing? And it was the exact opposite. He, he's very respectful of what it's like to be on the other side, and so most of the time he would give you 200 percent, and then always say, "Did you get it? Did you get it? Do you need it again? If you need me to do it again, I'll I'll I'll, I'll do it again." You know, and, and he just understands the dilemma you can fall in of even with all the best of intentions, you didn't get the take that you need. To the point where he would go on to another line, and yet in the back burner, his processors would still be going on that joke, and he'd stop and say, "Oh, let's go back," and he would redo. He'd get an idea, another idea for something that was about ten minutes ago, and yeah. then hit it out of the park, or you know, just to give us a different take on it. It was just wonderful. We learned with his sessions to just keep the tape rolling. We'll slate it later, some other time. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and he's he's a very much like Robin Williams in that respect. Is that he just his brain just is going and his and his mouth is just trying to keep up. Yeah, I mean, God bless Dave Salter and the editorial crew for having to, you know, do the comedy spelunking of going through a lot of material to you know to get some of that. He was he was concerned about playing kind of the straight man in this in this comedy duo because he's he's so used to kind of you know just being the funny guy. We kept telling him you, you're you're the the heart of this movie. It's who the movie's about, and it, and the, the role has a lot of responsibility. Very much like I, I would say Woody did in in the Toy Story movies. It, it's not obviously where all the humor is coming from, yet it is where a lot of the humor is coming from. It's just not people's first impression because mm -hmm. uh, there's so much more meat to the role. There's so much more emotion and depth of, of what needs to be carried. And uh, he even said to himself, goes, I think you've made me more charming than, than I probably would be <laughs> as in the, in, on live action with, as a fish. And I said, well, hopefully we have, you know. Right. So the sound on the whole film was designed and mixed by Gary Rydstrom and Gary Summers up at Skywalker Ranch. And I think it's probably the best mix uh, we've ever done in any of our movies. It's amazing when you take the dialogue off how much you can appreciate it. So here's a little taste. Anglerfish was, for me... The scariest, <laughs> scariest darn fish I've ever, ever, ever seen in the National Geographic magazine. I used to turn the pages faster. You know, I'd like, I'd like, like try to skip past those pages when I was looking through those magazines as a kid. You guys just thought, oh, I, th I think it's really so the creepy. one. I think it's the one thing in our planet that's the closest to being a real monster. Such a pleasant name for a fish. <laughs> Angler fish. Hey, I'm fishing for something. <laughs> <laughs> but it's pretty amazing. They do exactly. You know, not as, not as. You know, entertainingly, but they do pretty much what's happening in this movie. They, they, they have a, an antenna with a, a luminescent, bioluminescent fluid that, that 
glows in the dark and it attracts other fish and once they get close enough then they kind of come out of the dark and just chomp them up and they look like aliens if you watch it's amazing if you if you uh, rent uh, on video the blue planet special you can see the only uh, actual live anglerfish that have ever been captured on film before it, there's some there's some species Cree P. Oh. there was a kid in one of the the previews that was talking about the angler Say yeah, yeah. When we when we previewed this with the test audience, there was this. Um, I remember we had a, like a focus group afterwards, like a small group of people talking about the movie. And there was this mom who said, "You know, I, that scene with the anglerfish. I think it's a little too scary for kids. You know, I think you guys should maybe think about cutting it down." And but there was a lot of refusal. Like we saw all these heads. Yeah, they're like, "No, oh, no, no, no it's good. And this and this kind of really brainy kid raised his hand and he said, uh, "You know, if you tone down the anglerfish, then." It's like you're toning down nature itself. <laughs> and we were just like, How can you refute yeah. that? How can you refute that? <laughs> that kid reminded me of me at that age. We call this the initiation sequence. We actually came up with this on the road. Yep, uh, I remember sitting eating my fast food, and across the table, you said, what about an initiation? <laughs> and I said, that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard. I'm all I against said, that. I, I said, quit. But we would sometimes take a drive down to L.A. instead of flying to do recording sessions, and we'd find ourselves for six or seven hours having completely no phone calls, no interruptions, no other meetings, and, and we were able to just be a writing team and just talk out scenes and, and just really flesh out ideas or, or solve story problems. And this was one of them. We just yeah. needed we needed something more dynamic and entertaining to bring in all this exposition of this plan of escaping that Gil had. And we knew we had all this tiki stuff in the tank. And it just got us going about what if you did this sort of sort of mock sort of hazing ceremony to like make him be part of the gang. And we thought it would immediately make the gang even more likable than their first impression because it's what a little kid would do it's what a little kid would do with his friends in the neighborhood if they wanted to suddenly make a club and you had to come up to their tree fort and you had to swear your solemn oath and and be a blood brother and and it i just think it made you emotionally more fond of the whole gang and and nemo's stay in the tank that you knew that they were going to look out for this kid right and, and that nemo would know that and that nemo would start trusting them to, to do whatever you know because gill is about to propose a pretty scary escape plan that nemo might not have done had he not been welcomed into this little secret society and also we just had to turn on the volcano it was yeah, just too cool, too cool. <laughs> so it was so fun to work with the cast of this tank i mean these were all my first choices and they all said yes thank goodness because um, i just couldn't imagine anybody else's voice for these characters um i got where to start uh, allison janney she was the voice of peach the starfish on the glass allison janney just had this great you know matter of fact way of speaking which is exactly what peach needed because she just knew all these facts and brad garrett just hit a home run as as uh, blow the blowfish you know brad is the funniest guy on the planet just a treat to work with him in person and uh, of course, played Dim and Bugs Life. And Vicki Lewis, uh, who did uh, Deb and Flo, uh, she was uh, just this a powerhouse of energy. Stephen Root uh, is the actor who played Bubbles. You know, we wanted Bubbles always to be this very kind of just uh, like vibrating, shaky, uh, nervous dog almost, just like a little puppy dog. And it was amazing, you know, just the range that he was able to get out of um, just such a simple character. And then uh, Austin Pendleton played Gurgle. Actually, Austin is somebody I've wanted to use his voice since Toy Story. Um, I think we're all sort of showing our age, but we remember him the most from the Muppet movie. Muppet movie, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but he has, su he has such a great, anxious voice, and he can sort of whine and feel nervous, and it's very appealing and very memorable. Ah, uh, the what we like to call the David Fincher escape plan. <laughs> we just thought this was such a great way to get a lot of exposition out and make it interesting. It's funny because in, in, our, in our films at Pixar, we always show a lot of restraint typically with the camera. Yeah. You know, even though we're doing CG and we could move the camera anywhere we want and have it zip around, we don't do it. We've always tried to keep the films very rooted in a kind of a live action sensibility, makes them feel more like a real film. Um, but obviously we didn't do that during the escape plan. We just kind of went hog wild and made this one big, long, crazy camera move because we could. And uh, I also think the film grammars changed a lot in the last 10 years it's it, you know a lot of what you used to only see on mtv is much more uh 
utilized in movies, and, and some of it's become common language. And so, you know, I was feeling at times like we were still stuck in in an older school of of of, of film grammar, and to just question it at times and sort of open it up and see if it fit in some place, not do it gratuitously. And uh, I really felt like we had a good balance. Yeah, I mean, I was struck when I first came to Pixar at the discipline that our camera had. I mean, in the computer world, you can do anything you want. You can fly anywhere you want in the scene. And the fact that we are mimicking boom shots and crane shots and things that are actually out there, you know, gives it a, a sense of reality, which is nice. Albert actually improved almost this entire moment here, and it was such Albert Brooks gold. It was, it was, it was really good. So much of this was just the kind of stuff that's hard to write, where you're not completing sentences and changing ideas and stumbling over yourself. It, it just feels so real, and to to do that and then animate a character speaking that way, it kind of messes with your mind a bit because in animation, typically voices are so kind of controlled and clean because because animation is so tightly controlled and, and, and shaped and to have a moment like that that feels so completely spontaneous is exhilarating. I even have to sometimes explain this to the voice actors that it's really the combination of the animator and the voice actor, yeah, the physical that, acting and the that, voice, that give you the character and the animation is driven by what the voice actor does. People always, I get that question so many times, what do you do first? Do you animate and then do the recording of the voice or the other way around? It's like it's always the voice first whenever we can because for exactly what we're explaining. Sometimes, the, many times, the actor will just do something you would never have expected for that line reading, and it will evoke imageries in your head that you would never have considered, or choices, acting choices, visual acting choices that an animator would have never added to their plate had they not heard the way that line was read. The fish behind them, was, that was a difficult challenge, was it not to get those? Technically, that is uh, a very, very hard and amazing for what they did. Um, those all those fish that you're seeing are all really there and they're all copying each other and they're all slightly a little off of each other justin ritter was really the guy that kind of solved this uh early on for how to make them sort of move into shapes and feel like fish swimming into those shapes what was the inspiration for that for this whole gag early on actually it was looking at a lot of footage real schools of fish it is so fascinating the shapes and the actual formations that all you know uh, tuna and and uh, anchovies and all these kind of fish and moonfish can swim into it's just amazing it's their only defense is to get into a big big ball or a big blob right and, and so you intimidate the predator that way just from an imagery standpoint you wanted to put it in the movie and then the, you know of course you'd like it to ground it a little bit more and then it became well geez if you could make that shape what if you could make any shape and then the whole charades thing just sort of hey, fell into busy. it you wouldn't know how to get there would you what you want to do is follow the eac that's uh east australian current big current can't miss it it's in that direction and then so we should talk about thomas newman before this movie gets too far along i always had several main characters that i knew I needed for the movie. Uh, there was Marlon, Dory, uh, Nemo, and Gil, and believe it or not, Thomas Newman's music. I, I always knew that that was a essential ingredient to the storyline. Um, I always write to movie scores and, and orchestra to pieces to sort of get me into the, the mode, but this is the first time that I really attached myself to a composer and uh, from, from the get-go of writing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I remember you were all excited, Lee, about the, the music for this moment here. Nice trench. Hello! Hello! Okay, let's go. Oh, bad trench, bad trench. Come on. Well, I'm a huge fan of The Shining. I, I, I will make no apologies for that. And uh, Thomas Newman, when he, when he wrote the score for this section, uh, copied this technique called a Kalina, where the entire orchestra basically takes their bows and taps against the violin, and, uh, against the strings. And it's an incredibly creepy sound. I don't know if it's just creepy to me, because <laughs> I find The Shining so frightening. But um, this, that was probably one of the most thrilling moments for me on this entire movie. And a lot of them wouldn't pull out their bows. They'd actually pull out an older bow or pencils. Pencils, yeah, because they, uh, they said it ruined their bows. Well, you were attacked by a violin as a child. Right? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's another story. Jellyfish. Squishy. That's a Dave Reynolds line. Squishy. 
I saw this amazing footage um, of all these jellyfish in Palau. And I, sadly, they don't exist anymore. I guess they've all died off. Um, and it was freshwater. But there's just these cameras moving through this forest of jellyfish. And it was just the most gorgeous yet creepy thing I'd ever seen. The, the fact that something so beautiful could be so potentially deadly, I found that that uh, contradiction or that juxtaposition to be so engaging. I thought that's a perfect sort of obstacle for Father to have to go through for uh, for getting not only closer to Nemo, but uh, for, for sort of facing his fears. And luckily, technically, it was an incredibly easy sequence to produce. Oh yeah, it was just a breeze. <laughs> it took about a week. Seven TDs lost their Actually, lives. I think most of this stuff is over the counter. And uh, yeah, wasn't there, it's called a, I Jellyfish. It was a jellyfish plug-in. I just saw a documentary. No, there are still TDs that cry when they look at this, and it's not for the beauty of it. Um, but uh, it's gorgeous, and it was well-earned. It was just, uh, it, it's, it, it is beyond what I, I hoped it would look like, let alone what I thought we could do. Right, and story-wise, obviously, this is kind of the first veneer uh, cracking a little bit of father's uh, fear of, of the ocean and it's his first time that he's ever begun to enjoy life and to put his fears aside and just be in the moment and loosen and, up a little bit right and so Dory his surrogate child is, is taking him to this this wonderful place so what do you have to do after you give him a little something to enjoy you gotta set him back <laughs> that's right <laughs> like any good main character and uh, go in and rescue her the clownfish is the winner! Woohoo! We did it! Look at us! Tori? You were telling us a really interesting story about jellyfish. Yeah. Somewhere. Well, I just saw a documentary that off of Australia, there's a place that uh, has the most deadly creature on the planet, and it's a box jellyfish. And if its tentacles go across, like, your chest, it can stop your heart. That's what its venom does, and it's like 12 seconds. So literally, it is the most dangerous creature on the entire planet. Really? You, wh what did you see this on? I saw it on Animal Planet, I believe, the top 10 most deadly creatures on the, the planet. It was number one? It was number one. What was yeah. number two? Um, Charles Nelson Ray. <laughs> <laughs> he says, we like Charles Nelson Ray. <laughs> and I do too. I do like Charles. I'm just kidding. I love Charles Nelson Ray. We realized we had done this great test early, early, early on before the movie was done of showing how we could do refraction at the corner of the tank, just like in real tanks, we end up getting a double image. It was a really, really, really cool test. And then, however, we were a couple months out and we go, we never put that in the movie. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, lucky to have someone out there who's looking for you. He's not looking for me. He's scared of the ocean. Because the ocean page any movement there's an earlier version of the, of the film where gill was actually lying to nemo and had manufactured this whole false history just to try to um, impress nemo and, and when nemo finds out that he's been lied to he's he's completely betrayed and it was all interesting stuff but but unfortunately one of the byproducts was you, you really didn't like gill yeah honest just really didn't like gill and and um you know when that aspect of, of, of his story kind of went by the wayside, you know, even though he's a kind of this intimidating character in some in some regards, he you, you ultimately really like the guy. I had made this early on. I had made the simplistic equation that if Father doesn't, the Marlin character doesn't seem to be everything that Nemo wishes his dad was, yet turns out to have the goods. I thought I should do the opposite. I should have a, a, this adventurous fish in this tank that had been everywhere and done everything, and then you find out that he's not all those great things. I, I just assumed you would do the opposite. And, and I think we made it work on one level, but the other byproduct was it was really long to set that all up. It took a, and we, we actually, for taking that out, we ended up cutting the amount of tank sequences in half. And that, sh that whole storyline just, just got so truncated down to its bare essence. Right, as a byproduct of that, it felt more like Marlin's film. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's what it all came Marlin. down to, is that at a certain point in time, the film was equally Marlin's film and Nemo's film. Yeah, and it was never the intention, it sort of crept up on us. Yeah, you're trying to flesh out these characters and make them interesting, and they all end up having their own stories, and, uh, you know, it's a trap we've fallen into in the past. Oftentimes, you just need to find their shtick and find their one or two, three 
great moments and then let that be the character. And this is obviously something that Nemo's father, Marlin, would never have let him do. So he's off on this adventure, you know, doing dangerous things that, uh, you know, are, are showing him life. It's true. That's one of the things I... I you know, this is a much shorter storyline because the movie's more about Father than it is about Nemo, but we thought, well, in, in this sort of sub-story with Nemo, we should at least give some contrast to, you know, having a different kind of parent. And so we thought, okay, let's have one that gives him a little bit too much freedom, sort of. Right. I, re- I You know, for me, I always remember my favorite teachers uh, or counselors or, or coaches were the guys that sort of, tre- you felt like you were being treated as an equal, that you weren't a kid that, that didn't understand things yet and, and sort of played down to. And so I thought that's how Gil would, would treat Nemo. But the, but the one danger is that you can put a kid at risk when you didn't mean to, when you're that Kind of, when you're that loose with with parenting, yeah, in a way, it's a very selfish thing for Gil to put him in there because he's putting the child safety over his need to escape back to his home, and and that's kind of what Gil learns there. Yeah, or the opposite of what you just said. But who knows? <laughs> You'll have to play it back and find out who's right. Right. <laughs> so we went through several voices trying to get the right one for Crush. We ended up with. Uh, who is this guy? Some jerk. But basically, <laughs> we all do our own Scratch. And scratch, obviously, is temporary voice that we, we add in for, for our reels, which is story drawings that we videotape and then put temporary sound. And that's how, you know, Bob ended up being Roz and Bob Monsters Incorporated and Mr. Ray in this movie. And I was doing Scratch for Crush, and we just couldn't find the right person, and we had to do a test screening with it, with a real audience. And so my Scratch went in there, and it went over so well. We said, all right, you get to... You get to be crushed, which was not my intention. Were you really excited when you got the call that you got the card? <laughs> yeah, I called myself. <laughs> and I said, I got a surprise for you. I'm like, really? Are you sitting down? Yeah, I switched phones. Um, actually, I, actually, I just used the two lines on the phone. <laughs> a lot of the crush dialogue was just one about two-hour session in my office. You were tapping into some <laughs> surfer, uh, I don't know, you were just a vessel for a higher surfer that day, but it just all started flowing. It was great. Yeah, I, I just got out of your way and started typing. I remember was... I was lying on the couch. I was so tired. And, and, <laughs> and you were just reading the actual scripted line. And then I just, it's like I had this little dictionary in my head about how to modify it. Yep. And I would just kind of keep talking like oh. this. Matter of fact, uh, Crush has been in the movie from the beginning. Uh, but the very earlier version of Crush was a little bit more of a Dennis Hopper, Apocalypse Now type of character. Like an aging hippie. This is also a pivotal scene, story-wise, just for Father. Obviously, he uh, yet again, his character is framed by the behavior of others. In this case, this really laid-back, wise turtle uh, is really the guy who gives him the lesson of parenthood. You know, lays it all out for him right here. That, uh, you know, you, you really can't control what happens in life, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't just live it and, and make the best of it, really. Thank you for that lesson, Bob. You're welcome. You can take that and use that in your life. (laughs) (laughs) I I really wanted the kids to be fun, so we had their shells to uh, be much more colorful and flowered, like little Hawaiian shirts. Um, I thought that would be really cute. In addition to the really cute voices. (laughs) (laughs) The one fact that I really lie (laughs) about ocean-wise is is that uh, turtles are very solitary migrators. They don't migrate with a ton of other turtles, but I thought, well, nobody knows that for sure, and it's just too cool, and it helps the story to see the sort of nomadic, gypsy, free, loving family and all their kids together, and it was just such a visual sight in my head that I thought, ah, it's worth breaking that rule for this. Right. And then, used to say in the story, but now we just kind of uh, don't address it, but they're actually all swimming to Hawaii to, to go surf. It's always yeah. so great in movies when, when, in animation, when you when they get really little kids to, to do dialogue and they stumble over lines and they can, they right. they don't quite know their lines. It just feels so real. This little turtle that uh, is Crush's son, Squirt, is actually voiced by director Brad Bird's son, Nick Bird. Uh, Brad had actually come to me with a tape this is years ago and said, "I have the cutest voice ever for you," and so he gives this tape. And I play it, and it is, it is just, it is the cutest voice I've ever heard. It was like the, today's version of Thumper, and 
and it was his son. He's got three sons, and it was his youngest son, Nick. And I said, well, you know, he's very young. I mean, can he, can he come in and do I think it was four going on five or something, maybe five. And super time. smart, just able to read. He was doing, you know, mul multiplication tables and things. When you're the youngest of three brothers, I mean, and, and you're probably Brad's son, I think that <laughs> that's expected, you know. Right. He, but he was so witting, and we had such a great time with him. He just, you know, right out of the gate, would, he would just do anything we asked him to do. I recorded him for a few sessions, and uh, the, the very first time I met him, I sort of said, Hey, Nick, how you doing? Uh, are you excited about being in a movie? And he looked at me and went, Money, 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 money. <laughs> <laughs> no, then we told that to Brad Bragg. Got all night with Mike, oh, which is his older brother. <laughs> put him up to it. It was, really, it was really a treat working with him, because so often with little kids, especially kids that young, Directing them is more a game of just literally chasing them around the room and trying to get them to even stand in front of the microphone, which is what we dealt with with uh, Mary Gibbs, who played Boo in, yep. in Monsters. You're so young, yeah. But Nick, he would just total pro. He would just stand at the mic and ask if you know how we wanted a, a reading different. Do you want another take? Yeah, yeah. So, and in the spirit of uh, director's sons, I guess that's a good segue to that's my son right there doing the voice of that turtle passing on the information to the other fish. And how cool is that? I would have thought that was the coolest thing in the world. This was another really fun sequence. It, it just always worked from the beginning. I love this one. That's you, Andrew. Yeah. You're just kissing up to him. <laughs> <laughs> um, but just the, the visual sights of... This is just technically, to me, just oh, blows me away, the yeah. dolphins. So um, I'm actually a native of New England, and I and I couldn't let this movie finish without putting some insider references to Massachusetts. So uh, here are some of the insider things that I did, and of course it makes complete sense to do that in a movie about Australia, doesn't it? Of course. Mike, 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 seagulls. Uh, I grew up with a lot of seagulls, and uh, in my mind. Uh, they're rats with wings. <laughs> you just, you, you, they're kind of cool for a while, and then they're not. And, uh, and we just thought it would be funny if they just only said one word, and it was mine. And, and uh, it just, it was so pure. They're like robots, you know? Yeah. <laughs> one, one thought in their program. It just made logical sense to us. Even though they've got all these other intelligent pelicans and all these other species can talk, it just... It didn't. It just made sense to us that you could get away with these sort of simple-minded birds that just knew one word. I suppose now is as good a time as any to show you all the great details and objects that went into dressing the, the dentist office set. One of the goals here was to uh, make sure that Father's plight connected with Nemo here, and that's that that sort of tag that was played with the information all the way to Nigel coming up here is what bolsters Nemo's resolve to keep going, which I know is... We always had news traveling uh, in many iterations of the story to, to Nemo finding out about his dad, but um, sometimes uh, it, had, it had a lot of different ways it panned out. Sometimes Nemo just didn't believe it, sometimes it had gotten exaggerated, um, but none of it worked 100% until we finally adjusted it to this, and it was, it was really once we had come up with the rigging of the filter. Um, it, it suddenly clicked with us one day to just not have the filter work, have Nemo try and fail, be scared to go in again, and then have the news of his dad doing such truly courageous things motivate Nemo to actually do something courageous and have the guts to do it again, so that his dad could lead by example for the first time in his life for his son to do something challenging, yet do it from such a remote place and still get to his son. I just, we just found that very moving. You know, every every kid I think has, or at least every boy has a, a deep down desire to wish that their father was Superman, and that if the occasion rose, that their dad would do the right thing and save the day if the, if the right circumstances came together. And I just think it kind of taps into that 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 universal male longing. This this moment here. Your dad followed the boat you were on like a maniac. Really? He's swimming and he's swimming and he's giving it all these goblins, three gigantic sharks, capture them. He blows them up. And it dies thousands of people and gets chased by a monster with huge teeth. And uh, Tom Newman uh, was really smart with how sparing he was with when the theme for the 
we call it the egg theme, that the, or the Nemo theme, plays in this movie. It only plays at about five moments, I think, in the film. And uh, he uses it, of course, when Father discovers the egg. Um, and he also uses it right here when uh, he's hearing about his dad. And it just kind of gives it that little bit of deeper connection on the grander scale of their whole storyline. Once we came up with this idea uh, in the tank to rig the filter, we actually got a filter and broke it apart. And I wanted to make sure that this could logically happen. So we looked at all the workings of the mechanics and we figured out that you truly could wedge a pebble into the filter, uh, the blades, and, uh, you know, stop it from turning. So it ended up being a very simple, primitive idea, but it was very, you know, made it nice and clear and, and exciting. As possible. Think dirty thoughts. We're going to make this tank so filthy that dentists will have to clean it. Good work. Now, the EAC, which is the East Australian Current, truly exists. And he came to me with a bunch of stuff that he, he'd, he'd done research on about uh, all the different currents that were there, and we found out that there truly was a, literally an underwater map that you could take from the Great Barrier Reef to get yourself to uh, Sydney. And so we thought, well, let's just treat it like a highway. Let's treat it like I-5 is here in California. And all the different fish ride it and have to take exits and off ramps to off of eddies to get there. And eddies actually do swirl off, and they look a bit like a big water slide in, in, their, in their shape and design. And so we thought that would just probably be the coolest, funnest thing to do. They move pretty fast, these currents, don't they? Yeah, and they actually, the one thing Ralph always wanted to try and do, but we just never had the, the vantage point to take advantage of it, was that they actually are a little bit different in color than the rest of the water, too, when you have different temperatures and stuff. And that, that's another cool, fascinating aspect of nature in the ocean that people don't always know about. <laughs> Again, this is Father uh, really starting to enjoy life. You know, he's down that path to being uh, someone who can uh, have fun. Yeah, I remember the uh, the initial response when he came out of the off-ramp was, you know, being just all nervous and, and scared. And then we suddenly went, well, wait a minute, he, he should be surprised that he's actually getting a little used to being this much of a thrill seeker. Well, especially after the jellyfish, yeah. yeah. You don't want to go backwards with him. So it's just one of those tiny advancements that makes a huge difference in the long run. But those can easily elude you when you're making these movies in pieces. We also added this little bit about uh, figuring out how old the sea turtles are so that he can he has something to grab onto to tell his son. Because it happened to just be one of the, the questions that just gets thrrown out by Nemo when they're going to school in the beginning was how old the sea turtles. And you really ran with that because I remember at the very end of the movie, you wanted it to get back into sort of casual speak between Nemo and Dad and, and, uh, and rather than staying in this sort of big, profound, we're aware of the end of the movie kind of dialogue. And, and you, you returned with the sea turtles, and then it was like, duh, it's, it's sitting right there in the middle of the movie for us. We've got these sea turtles right there that he meets. Right, nice little thread throughout the film. You have this nice, happy accidents. I mean, you had the idea to expand this little game that they were playing. Oh, I think it's an example of, of editing, saving a gag. The yeah. gag was not funny of playing I Spy until you sort of started doing the overlapping of it. Well, you just wanted to feel like they've been wandering in this in this murk for hours yeah. and hours, and she's been doing nothing the entire time but playing the same yeah. I Spy game. Now, this is one of the older sequences in the movie. It's actually been around a long time. I don't even if it's is it if it's, is it pre Bob? I mean, we, was this sequence around this when it came on? Yes, it was. And um, it was one of the first sequences where we got dialogue working well between Dory and Father. Um, it didn't just kind of. <laughs> <laughs> that was Lee. Pardon me. <laughs> uh, but I remember that it was never. Even even though it was working from a sort of cadence in the way they sort of, he was worried and she wasn't, she was optimistic, he was pessimistic, that we had going for it, and then, but, you know, Bob, you really called it, you said it's just not funny enough, there's not something that's really just making it go to the level that we'd expect our scenes to go, and, and so you came up with the idea of what if she spoke well? You know, that was just one of six sort of shotgun ideas, and a lot of times when you write these things, it's about list making, and one of them that tucked away down there in the script was that she spoke well, and, and I just sort of wrote it out phonetically, and then we got together 
you and I, Jeff Pigeon, we talked about how to even take it farther, and the idea came up that she would literally speak English while she was speaking, yeah. so you could hear what the words were in there. You yeah, know, our first session, whether we tried whale sounds, and then um, actually trying to speak a whale language, and then speaking words just with a whale kind of slant on it. Right. And um, I thought she would. I thought she was going to like walk out if I if I asked her to do this, and I was amazed. She just kind of went, "Okay." And yeah, we didn't even have to sort of do it for her. She she's so smart. She knows whales. She, she said her next door neighbor had whale sounds that she was always playing to relax, <laughs> and so she knew. She just knew the vocabulary to do it, and it, she, she just did it right off right. the bat. It was amazing. The full spectrum too, from the <laughs> down to the high stuff. You know. <laughs> Brett Coderre was really sort of the the guy that set the visual look for how pushed her face was but it, actually if you go back Ronnie Del Carmen uh, who was the head of story on, on Nemo actually uh, did the boarding for when she spoke well and the animators really ran with that and then there's actually a test we did really early on to sort of prove the look of this movie and we had uh, uh, Marlon's character just kind of hanging out in the middle of this big blue void in this whale slowly comes out of the mark and approaches him from behind and it makes this big scale adjustment and uh, we actually decided that that uh, was the way to play this gag at the end of the, the whale approaching yeah, for the longest time it was coming at them we had the right. so it was coming from the front yeah. and, and we finally thought my god it was working so well in that test let's just do that well, for you geeks, if you see our first trailer, you actually see shots of the whale approaching from the front because we actually made that decision after we cut our first trailer. Fascinating. Hope somebody lost their job over that. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually hard for us to remember the actual flow sometimes of what was in the picture and when it came into the picture because you go through so many iterations over the course of three and a half years. Yeah, it wasn't actually not that long ago there wasn't a scene in the film where the tank got all mucky and full of algae. And there was just this date that, that on the calendar of when the dentist was going to clean the tank and then the aqua scum came in. And it just wasn't visceral enough. You weren't feeling it. It was too much information to track so we finally decided that we should go ahead and let Nemo succeed at jamming the filter and let the let it look like the plan was really working because then they had that much further to fall when, uh, right. when the dentist put in the aqua scum. And putting Nemo into the filter was generated from the whole idea of give him something that he will be responsible for but then let him fail and let his father be the news of his father make him then fix it so it served it that was the bigger service and then it allowed it just told you you had to have the structure of tank clean then tank dirty then tank clean again right i mean it seems it seems like an obvious set piece right now and bob keeps trying to, <laughs> bob keeps trying to jump in and oh, i just keep jumping on him <laughs> this is what it's like at work i just sort yeah. of bob this keeps trying to life. talk i jump in my mom i, 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 I think that we should try that okay go ahead well, the nice thing about the algae, all these great gags flow out of it, which, you know, it's a sort literally. of a byproduct. Yeah, literally. Coming up here is, a, I think, one of the most beautiful themes that, uh, that Tom wrote for the film, this kind of melancholy journey back to, uh, to find Father and Dory inside the whale. We had always called it haiku, and then Tom was like, why do you call it haiku? And a long time ago, it was, it was five images that just slowly brought you to the whale and we just kind of took it as literal visual poetry of getting to the whale and as eh, that old heady crap and you're trying to make that stuff more than it is <laughs> but the, the name kept sticking so we changed it to that monkey has my money <laughs> we changed it to <laughs> hey hi you know the surfing i'm not lucky rival flavin give us the diamond well, now that you've set the tone for this whole <laughs> sad <laughs> sequence but sorry about that <laughs> This was one of those, I don't know how in the world we're going to do this sequences. I said, it's got to be inside the whale, and it's rocking gently back and forth. It's almost like a little lullaby, and the, the waves are just like a wave machine. Those little wave machines you had as kids where you sort of tilt it one way and tilt it the other. And, and the technical guys are sitting and nodding. Mm -hmm. and then, they, then they get in their car and they drive to Mexico. <laughs> it was like a, but everything I listened about it was a checklist of like, can't do that, can't do that, can't do that. Get going. And, uh, man, they just pulled pulled out all the stops, and it's exactly what I pictured in my head. It's amazing. That, again, you never thought you could ever get. And just the natural quality of the water, I'm just, you know, it's so hard to do that in computer graphics. The, the organic flow of water and splashes, it's just amazing. You know you've got a good thing going when they come back to you and say, well, 
we put it in the water, but we felt it didn't look real enough. So we we uh, just uh, came up with a program that gave us this foam that sort of spreads on the top. And it's like, you didn't even ask for that. And you can just tell they're just so invested in it that they want to plus it. <laughs> this, uh, this moment here where Dory swims down to Marlin is really touching. And, um, you know, we, we make these movies all out of order sometimes. You know, we'll perfect scenes later in the film and then later go back and improve scenes earlier in the film. And it was after we got the scene working really well that we went back to the scene where, where Father first meets Dory. And both in the dialogue and visually how we shot the, the moment, we tried to make this moment of Dory swimming down to Father feel very similar when, when she first swims down to help him at the beginning. And we literally used the exact same dialogue. I just thought, you know, maybe people will just feel it. Maybe somebody will actually recall it. But I just thought it was really poignant that that's her default state. She's going to be that... She's the caregiver. Helpful, right. I always called her the angel. She's mm -hmm. the angel. She just kind of comes down and is just willing to help. The sound mix on this movie was so great. Um, particularly in the sequence, you can you could tell how well it's done. I mean, the subwoofers particularly are so intense at this moment. I mean, you should just be cranking your home theater system right now. And if you're not and you don't have one, you should take out the disc, eject it, and go run to, like, the good guys or Best Buy and put it in something and, and crank it. Well, I think one of the coolest things for me being at Pixar all these years is that we've gotten consistently on all of our films to work with Gary Rydstrom and, and the whole gang up at Skywalker. Well, yeah, and Gary Rydstrom has been with us even before any of us were here. You know, and Gary worked on the original short, like so Jr., with, uh, with John, and he did the sound for all the shorts, and he's done the sound design for all of our feature films. And, uh, you know, even though he doesn't work here in the building with us, um, he, uh, he's, kind know, of he's, he's really part of our family. Yeah, he's like an extended Pixar. Okay, that one was a little tougher. He either said we should go to the back of the throat or... So coming up here is this really amazing shot that one of our technical directors, Martin Wing, did as a test just to show us how water could come off the tongue. But uh, originally, we wanted it to come up slow. Yeah, the tongue was just going to kind of slowly rise up out of the water, but we saw this test and it was like, wow! It was, just, it was like the most amazing thing we'd ever seen. So of course we had to put it in. Put it in the movie. It just gave such scale and power and help make them seem that much more helpless. Yeah, when something that big can move that fast. Yeah, you know, exactly. really, wow, moves fast for a big tongue. Uvula, whale uvula. <laughs> We've had quite a few uvula in our film. Have we? Yes. <laughs> we have to start a gallery. It's time to let go! And I remember you and I deliberated on this dialogue here, right, Bob, and, and you, you really called it. We... we when he finally asked you, how do you know? How do you know something bad is going to happen? And, and you just went, I, you don't. You know? And I thought, you know what? That's it. That's the truth. That is the truth of fearing, you know, the possible consequences of things. Yep. Just have to keep swimming. Yep. There are tons and tons of boats in this movie, as you can probably tell. And all of them have to have names. And we had a fun time coming up with lots of different names for the boats. But you'll probably only catch a few here and there in certain shots, but most of them <laughs> ended up being kind of oblique to camera or off in the background. And uh, we thought this would be a perfect format to show off all the names that we came up with. Thank you, sir. Nor will it be by the time you see this. <laughs> When I pitch this movie to people, they say, how are they going to get up into that dentist office? Sure, they can get there. <laughs> so this is something we had to solve. Yeah, we used to always say, I remember way back in Toy Story, we, we really kind of broke it down. It's like there's two ways you can tell a story. Either you have no idea what's going to happen next and you're dying to know, or you pretty much know where it's going to end up, but you don't know how it's going to get there. And uh, this movie is very much that latter method of storytelling. And you hope these sort of technical things you have to solve end up being associated with really entertaining things, and in this case, the seagulls really, you know, help with that. What are we gonna do? What's it say, Paige? Mm -hmm. yeah. I can't hear you, Paige. The Aquascum 2003 is an all-purpose self-cleaning maintenance free... <laughs> Aquascum dialogue of the manual. That's just kind of thing. You're standing there and you're having Allison Janney, this Emmy award-winning actress, read these lines. <laughs> you're just going, oh my gosh, okay. I hope you're not... I hope you're not offended that I'm having you read about the Aquascum 2003. Same thing happened with Jeffrey Rush. He had to he had to do dialogue as a as a pelican with water in his gullet. 
and it just wasn't sounding right, so we had to pull his tongue. Pull his tongue, and he's talking like this. And I remember just having this flash moment going, I just told an Oscar award winning actor to hold his tongue and read this line, and he's doing it. Whoa. <laughs> We liked it so much we had the, the entire loop group hold their tongues for like eight people and record like that. Remember that? <laughs> yep. Because yep. it's it's pretty funny that, to talk like that for, for dentists. It was for people that were dental patients. People that were dental patients. Yeah. yeah. The shader for this bag. I mean, that's one of those, you know, every once in a while something just sort of drops in your lap that just hits it right on the bullseye. And this the shader they came up with for what it looks, the refraction and the highlighting and the creasing of a... Of a plastic baggie when you wrap it together. They just completely nailed it. You won't go belly up. I promise you're gonna be okay. We were very proud because when we were doing an ADR session at the end of the film with Jeffrey Rush, who was from Australia, uh, when he saw some of the images of the Sydney Harbor here, especially that, that one opening shot, he said, you know, you guys just nailed it. You did it. It's Sydney. Yeah, he was really impressed. We do have one name for a boat that we really wish we had gotten in there, but we never did, which was the Tipping Hedron. And uh, we're kind of wishing we had gotten for the birds. Yeah. Well, Gerald and Nigel actually were going to originally conceive to be more, have more character stick together. Gerald was going to be this sort of sloppy, messy, oil slicked, you know, kind of bird, while Nigel was going to be very fastidious and neat and tall. And I don't know, it just ended up always becoming as stereotypical as it sounds and it just we never could make a scene that was worthy of it's like the whole movie was stopping just yeah, to make exactly. some stick. If you, I don't know somehow you you still have to go that route originally to find your characters but you end up usually throwing that kind of stuff out because it doesn't push anything forward well I mean the, you know that's efficiency and, and, and that definitely was something that uh, we talked about along the way um, we listened to uh, Nichols and May and uh, there was this great line where uh, a mother calls her son, and uh, the only line she says is, uh, this is your mother, remember me? And you get it immediately, yeah. and so that's the kind of thing we always talked about striving for. Yeah, that became our touchstone line. It says, it doesn't have the, it's your mother, remember me, economy. And, right. we, and, we, and we have so many characters, you just need to get it. You need to get it right out of the gate. Uh, and how does that make me live? Uh, this pelican scene that had been in the movie for a long, long, long time, but it wasn't until we added the seagulls to the end. You know, just boosted that whole sequence up to a level that it had never been at before. Yeah, I remember Derek bringing all this footage and you showing us your first cut. And we just... static. Who does the voice of those um, seagulls, by the way? I believe it's Andrew Stanton, the director of uh, Finding Nemo. How many... Were you going to let anyone else do voices in this film? Oh, I mean, see, I knew it was going to go there. Keep it to yourself. <laughs> Because you haven't won an Oscar, you have to get your voice yeah. in everywhere. You okay, can. first of all, this will never make it to the DVD now. <laughs> well, in that case, <laughs> okay. Oh, escape! It's an escape scene. You know, this this the scene was in the film all along in the story reel. This this idea of having all this complete chaos in the in the dentist's office at the end. And, uh, you know, it seems like every movie we make, there's one scene that we just dread going into production on because we know how incredibly difficult it's going to be. And uh, on this movie, it was <laughs> definitely this, this whole escape uh, sequence. Every shot had multiple technical things going on. Simulated hair, simulated cloths. Hair, the splashes. Water, yeah, water simulated tubes, human animation. Uh, it was it was an, a nightmare. all the most complicated models in the movie pretty much are packed together in the scene. <laughs> so everybody just was in denial. They just kept putting it off, putting it off until there was no other sequence we finally, to do. You know, we finally hit that day. Like, well, <laughs> anything left to do? <laughs> There's <Okay>. escape. Okay, <laughs> gotta dive on in. <laughs> Can't we just leave it out? But, uh, it, you know, it's, it's it ended up being a ton of fun, and so uh, everyone everyone really loved working on it. It's just so crazy and. Um, there's just some really incredible animation in here. Um, Doug Dooley did some great pelican and dentist animation, and uh, Tasha Whedon did some really, really great Darla animation in this scene. She really just kind of found that character. Darla 
was voiced by a uh, true Australian, uh, Lulu Eberling, or Eberling, I'm sorry, Lulu, if I'm pronouncing your last name wrong. She's from Melbourne, Australia. And how do we record somebody from Australia? Well, in today's world, we actually have it over video conferencing. So when it was 9 in the morning there, it was about 8 in the evening here, and we would uh, be linked from our sound studio to theirs in Sydney. And uh, so I would see her on this big monitor, and she's about 6, I think, at the time that we recorded her. And uh, she was so sweet. Uh, just a little red-headed girl. She came in, and she was all sort of decked out, all sequined, uh, and she looked a little bit like a little princess. She had really dolled herself up for this recording session. It was so endearing. Yeah, we could see her, on, obviously, on the video monitor here, and she was cute. They didn't have a chair for her, uh, and the mic setup was such that she had to come in and stand at the mic, and you could only see the top of her head. For it was the just like these two little it. eyes poking up in the bottom of the, the frame the of the monitor. It was so cute. <laughs> and she was just, she would just, she was a trooper. She just gave it her all. Did she, uh, did she just write you a letter recently? Yes, she did. I just got a letter from her saying, to my director, like, you know, scrawled out when you're, when you're sick, and saying, um, can't wait for the movie. When is it coming out? Can I have some stickers? <laughs> 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 and that was it. That was, the, well, that was the, just the letter. So, of course, we're sending her stickers. You know she's the, the, the big hero at her elementary yeah, school exactly. right now. Exactly. You know? <laughs> it's great. It's so great. So we used to have an entire sequence of Nemo going through the sewage treatment plant. We actually visited the San Francisco sewage treatment facility and figured out how it all works and how a little fish could make its way through. Went through all the proper machinery and people would love us and say, oh my gosh, you really did it. And then we just cut it out because it took too long. Yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right. So now we get to the more somber part of the movie, and this is where our production designer, Ralph Eggleston, really just right out of the gate came out with these stunning pastels that just set the tone for not only this sequence, but the rest of the act. And uh, we should really show them off. They're just, they're gorgeous. So Goodbye Dory is what we call this moment. And um, the funny thing about this is, you know, Dory has to get really upset and, and be on the verge of tears and actually cry. and. I didn't know Ellen that well at the time. I'd only done uh, one session with her um, solo before um, I, I had her read this. And actually, it was really the end of our second session. And we were down to like the last 10 minutes before she had to go. And I thought, oh, geez, I have this, this monologue she has to do. And I just assumed comedian, easy, you know, comedy, easy, drama, crying hard. And, I, and, and it would take a while. So I thought, well, why don't we just kind of go through this and see how it feels. And the next session, we'll really work on it. And she read it and started to cry right off the first pass. It was amazing. And, and so you could hear a pin drop after that. And I just said, keep it, keep it wrong. Do you mind doing it one more time? She said no. And what was amazing was she did it on the second pass. She was already upset from doing the first reading. And so it had even more shakiness and, and, and pathos in it all the way through. And she only did it three times. And what you're hearing is, is pretty much a, a solid... Uh, take of I think the second one and it, it, I was just blown away I mean all of us were just you know holding back tears she just nailed it and uh, interestingly it was you know this whole game of scenes being in the film and not being in the film there was a whole period of time where, where that whole scene believe it or not was cut out of the film yes and um, again in the interest of keeping the film moving and, and, and the excitement of will Nemo get out will Nemo get out I mean it does break the rhythm and you can't fault that note, but we, when, when it was gone, you realized how unsatisfied you were with the resolution of Dory's character in the whole movie. Somehow it just felt sort of open-ended and, and in a bad way and, and unresolved. And Unfortunately, it wasn't as, just as easy as putting it back in. You know, we had to reverse engineer a whole bunch of little plot elements to get Father thinking Nemo had died. and It was a big rat's nest, but, but we worked it out. It's nice to have the system of checks and balances that keep you honest as you go through this process. People, you know, great, who are great arbiters of taste and giving you great suggestions. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I love this part. I love this part. No, this, Watch this. That's a great part. Remember that? That's great. Oh, I love that. Remember that? <laughs> I hate it when they do that on commentary. <laughs> Oh, I love this part too. This part's really great. No, the best commentary is where they just go. Um, this, uh.
Chirp, chirp, chirp. I'm Dory. I'm Nemo. Nemo? The, uh, and I just love the idea that Nemo meets Dory on his own. It's much the same way Father did. And once again, she services the job of an angel and just kind of leads Nemo to the answer. Wait a minute. Is it your dad or my dad? My dad. Got it. In this moment, uh, from the beginning, always paid off in spades. You have 35 images of the movie in three and a half seconds, just all of her memory rushing through her head. It's amazing that you can pick out. Some of these images are a frame long, but you get it, and, it, and you, you get that little flash of the, the moment earlier in the film. We actually called it the day in the life sequence with the orchestra going backwards. This is a moment that was always really, really funny in the storyboards, and it just got a hundred times funnier when it when it was animated. Yeah, Bobby Beck did this animation at your father. <laughs> She's suddenly a fish with a mission. Sorry. Now that she got to hear her memory slightly improved, there's no stopping her. It's like Dory as Linda Linda Hamilton in T2. <laughs> You've messed with the wrong fish. So that green crab is played by Rove McManus. He's a very famous TV celebrity, uh, sort of the Dave Letterman of Down Under. Uh -huh. So The Fishing Grounds was actually in the movie from the very get-go. First script, uh, I just knew that would be a very foreboding set piece. This is another one of those sequences that was surprisingly very easy to pull off. <laughs> we're so easy that we're still working on it right now as we speak. Yeah, this just sort of tested everything we've learned on making the whole rest of the film, not only technically, but procedurally. Uh, it's just getting fish not to bump into each other, because in the computer, they have these mathematical models, these, these polygons in space, and you can just jam two things together. They don't actually bump. So that's a real difficult thing to pull off. This is actually um, early, 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 early on, years ago when I was starting to put all the pieces together for the first idea of this movie, I thought, how am I going to end this thing? And uh, I knew I wanted something that would have to test the mettle of Father and Nemo for what they've learned through the whole movie. Um, but, you know, when you've gone through jellyfish and sharks and all these other set pieces, you're like, what's left? And um, I read this, I found this little article in the back of the paper, a tiny little thing, you know, about you know three inches by two inches across. It's just a tiny little blurb about... Uh, these cod fishermen in Norway were trying to pull up a whole net of fish and all the cod didn't want to go on the boat and they all sort of swam down in unison and capsized the boat. And I just thought that was fascinating, that just the collective might of all these fish. So that got us thinking that that's exactly sort of the locale they're going to be in. They're going to be just on the outskirts of the harbor getting out to the open ocean and there's going to be some fishing ground they're going to pass. And wouldn't it be great that not only is the power of what Nemo and Marlin have learned um, going to save them, but it's going to save Dory and it's going to save a hundred others. And just to, just to sort of amplify what can be done when the, when the right things connect. So, um, you know, we worked a lot on this just for the right dialogue, the right moments, just to how to slide it all. Like where do the motivations come from? Who has the idea to ask the fish to swim down? We were kind of back and forth whether that was Father and Nemo. And we finally found that by inserting the scene earlier where Gil taught Nemo to swim down to, to avoid being caught in the net in the tank. That allowed us to let Nemo come up with the idea at this moment. And it was, it was a great balance between, you know, Father being brave and allowing his son to, to shine at this moment. Yeah, because his big thing was to trust his son. Let, let Nemo have the great adventurous risky idea, but let Father be the one to let it happen and then help guide it. And because um, for me, it's a very touching little, you know, smile moment when he when he says, "That's my dad" to another fish as they're going down. I mean, it's 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 what every father would, you know, love to have motivated their child to do. I remember pitching this to to, to Roy Disney, and he said, "Do me one favor, don't capsize the boats. Bad luck for sailors and, and, and uh, ocean goers." And I said, "Oh, okay, no problem." Mm -hmm. So this shot coming up of father telling Nemo, guess what, Sea Turtles I Met One, is actually the last shot that was animated in the movie. It was given to one of our top animators, Doug Sweetland, and uh, he really wanted a juicy, dramatic s shot, um, and it took him weeks to do, and it was actually on a Saturday, I had come in uh, off hours to early in the morning to, to get some work done, and there was nobody here. It was like 7.30 or 8 in the morning, and and I walk into the lobby, and there's Doug Sweetland looking sort of haggard and tired. 
And uh, he sort of was shocked to see me, and he goes, I just finished my shot. And I go, you're kidding. And he goes, no. And he goes, will, will you final it? And I go, sure. And so we, we go over to look at the shot on his uh, workstation, and uh, it was just, it was gorgeous. It was exactly what you're seeing here. It was so moving, so sensitive, so subtle. And uh, and usually we have a big, you know, hurrah with horns and mariachi bands and everybody just cheering and parading around for the last shot being final. And since it was just the two of us, we just kind of leaped up in the air, whooped, hugged each other, ran around the building, and, and it was kind of fitting. It was a sort of underplayed yet exuberant final. And then Doug left for his vacation. Yeah, and literally he left the building like minutes after that to get on a flight and go on vacation. So here we get to the end of the movie, and now we have to actually pay off this bad joke that Father's been telling at the beginning. And I think it was uh, Ricky Nerva, one of our great artists, who came up with uh, the line, with fronds like these, who needs anemones? And he said it in some meeting, and I said, I gotta put that in there. But we do have, we do have recordings of Albert doing lots of different punchlines. We always save our epilogues for the very end. They're the very last thing we produce because we want to really get a sense of, you know, who the audience is keying into, which characters, which moments they like, because we want the ending to feel like a kind of a distillation of the, of the whole movie. Some of it's just not knowing your characters. That's the hardest thing to solve until you've got almost the whole movie up. But the bigger part is just getting your gut and the audience's reaction of what are the winning moments, the winning characters or gags that people might want to recall at the end of the movie. Squirt was a was a last minute idea, and the sharks actually weren't always in the uh, epilogue at, at the beginning. Um, that, those were definitely products of seeing how well they went over in the middle of the movie. And yeah, we had that previous screening, and the, the turtles went over great, and we, we, we weren't sure at first who we wanted to bring back, uh, Crush or Squirt or both of them, but we ended up going with uh, with Squirt, with Crush Jr. And so we had a discussion of what how could we do that? How could we get uh, Squirt back in there and, and end up being just one line that sort of bought him back in, which was uh, exchange student. student. Yeah. The setting was always there. I always knew I wanted to bookend this with Father sending Nemo off to school, overprotective in the beginning, and then at the back end to see how he's adjusted. And then it took this huge journey all over the ocean just to make that minor adjustment. In his character. The, just to see the next normal day between them. And then it's over. Barbara, I don't understand it. Tank epilogue. This is something we've always we always had, always wanted to do. It was questioned for a while, and thank goodness they said, "Oh, all right, this is the way to to sort of resolve it." Because I think everybody wants the tank members to get out, and this was the I thought the best way. There's no way to really have that be a part of the movie, so it was great to just have this little add-on epilogue. But again, it's like turning on itself. It's it's bittersweet, but then now what? You know, it's not just ending on the sweet moment. That's, that's what's cool. But... Hopefully you'll see them in baggies somewhere by your home. Now what? Uh, one of the things that um, I, was, I had a little bit of a, a mission about was I, I wanted to not do outtakes anymore. It's not that uh, I was against them. I loved them, and I thought they were hysterical, but I, I think everybody kind of came around to they, they've run their course. There, there actually is a limit to how many gags you can do in outtakes. You, after a while, you start to see the flubbed line and the, the pratfall and stuff. And One of the things that really got us inspired was seeing the company play work so well at the end of Monsters Incorporated. It, uh, it, was, it, was, it was integral to the film. It was indicative of the film. You wouldn't do it in any other movie. And... Um, and it was just, it was still yet a surprise and something funny and something to wait for, to stay in your seats for when the, when, when the lights came up. And so we sort of put our heads together, wanted the same sort of plus and surprise at the end, but we didn't want it to just feel something that you could generically put on the end of any movie. Right. So I remember we were in a room um, with Ellen Moon Lee, who is uh, one of our designers here, and she had put up a whole bunch of concepts for possible ways of dealing with our end credits. And... Uh, one that we immediately gravitated towards was a, a design that she had done that actually had all the different characters from our film kind of swimming around and interacting with the with the crawl as it went by, and that's the one that we uh, that we ran with. Right, because it feels unique to the movie. The, it, you're not going to unless you do a film about flight. I think you're going to be able to get away with just expecting and, and buying your characters from the movie just suddenly coming in from screen left and floating up and down and going in front or behind things, and so the fish aspect really 
supported going this way with it. It was also nice because it gave the animators a chance to, to come up with gags and, and really shine to, to do some business here. Yeah, because it allows them to sort of just, with no constraints of time and no constraints of setting, just sort of do some pantomime acting with the uh, characters, which is really an animator's first love. You know, the visual sort of pantomime shtick. Normally, the, you know, in the actual production of a movie, the, the animators are often very constrained by, you know, having to get an action across in, a, in an exact number of frames. And, and what we did here was give them an opportunity to be kind of more open-ended and just take however much time they needed to, you know, to get the gag across. It ended up being kind of a little thank you gift for all their hard work in the film. And now we come to the end of the movie and the end of the production. We have finished this thing, and uh, I don't know, you have anything you want to get off your chest, Bob? I had fun. I did, and learned a lot along the way. I was really glad to work on this project. Lee, you want to wake up? Anything else? Well, <clears throat> as usual, these movies are really, 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 really hard to make, but you know what? They are a blast, too. It's, 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 it's sometimes hard while we're in the midst of making them to appreciate that. It usually comes sometime after we finish the film and look back at the process, but, you know, there's just something that's so great about being surrounded by this crew of people that are just at the top of their craft. I mean, these are, these are some of the best people in the world, and we're so lucky to be working with them on a daily basis. And um, they make us look good. I mean, they... they <laughs> And they love working here. It's just uh, no, but I, I, it, it is amazing to realize, especially as you're getting down. What this is like, film five now. I have to count. It's five. Um, you know that you're working with, you know, a World Series caliber team. Uh, it's, it's like a professional, a professional Olympics team of, of people, and um, it really is wild to just turn the corner, uh, go to the nearby office, and and talk to somebody. It's just really is the best at whatever they do um, and will never cease to amaze me um, what images we can create uh, when we sort of get our act together. It really is uh, an astounding movie for me to watch now. Um, it's interesting when you do watch it, 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 you don't just see the film, it's like a, I call it kind of a, a quilt of memories kind of, you see. Uh, you see the memories of somebody coming up with an idea or someone conquered a technical issue and, and it's all just strung together, you know, the, the time you spend. It's a very dense four or five years that you put in on a project like this. There's a lot of names, a lot of faces, a lot of uh, funny things that are, you remember for, for each shot that you look at. Sometimes there's a lot of time that you remember too. You'll look at a shot and you'll go, wow, we spent six months on that. <laughs> you know, and then boom, it just goes, goes by in two by. seconds. But um, that's I don't know. I guess that's that's the business we're in, and uh, it, it it just it, it's just a stunning world that I I always knew would had the potential to be uh, really captivating to watch. Little did I know that that we would actually capture it. So does it does it uh, does the film look as good as you would hope? It, it looks. I, I'm not exact. I'm not you know just saying this. It, it looks better than what I thought. We would be able to capture. I thought we would be able to get away with less, and to think that we got more um, is just such a gift. And um, I still remember laying on the beach in Hawaii about four years ago, five years ago, reading uh, your first draft of this thing and thinking, "Man, this is going to be a really great movie." And it's. It seems like only yesterday, but here we are. The film's done, and geez, it makes me feel old thinking it's that long ago. <laughs> But uh, it, uh, you know, for anybody that's listening that actually worked on the movie, just a big, 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 big thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank Forever you. Forever grateful. You. Well, I do want to say that it has been, uh, well, not only have Bob Peterson and Leon Kritz saved my butt and made this movie as good as it is now, but it's been a real joy and a real pleasure working with them. And maybe I'll be lucky enough that someday you'll be hearing the three of us again on another movie someday. Uh, definitely. I think the thing that really struck me working with, with you on this is that it did come from experience as a father, and, you know, it, it really is a heartfelt project for you. A lot of the things that happened in this film really came from your heart, and that, you know, you, you have to keep that fire burning for four years, so I was so glad that you were 
Bernie to tell the story the whole time. That was great. And that was there in the original script. And I, you know, I often felt that my job on this film, in a great part, was to just help make sure that you achieved that vision that you had defined so cleanly years ago in your original script. And for the rest of you, um, thanks for watching. And I really hope you enjoyed the movie. And I also hope you enjoyed our, our ranting throughout this. Here's the secret of life. The secret of life is 